speck of dust on your coffee cup I can't see the light I can't see the light Breathe to be they try to fend for me Escape the night, escape the night And I wonder as the world goes down When answers to the call will go right through Say goodbye, I think to myself, could this be it for me and you? On this Easter Sunday, we gather in celebration of a cornerstone of faith and a beacon of hope for Christians around the world. Today marks the triumph of life over death, light over darkness, and hope over despair as we commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The significance of this day extends beyond the echoes of ancient scripture. It resonates deeply within the hearts of millions, symbolizing the eternal promise of renewal and redemption. Easter teaches us that after the longest and darkest of nights, the dawn will arrive, bringing with it light and a new beginning. As we reflect on the miraculous event that Easter Sunday represents, let us find in our hearts the strength to overcome our challenges, the courage to embrace change, and the faith to believe in the possibility of transformation. Let this day remind us that every end can lead to a fresh start, and within each of us lies the potential for resurrection in spirit and in truth. May this Easter fill your life with peace, joy, and the warmth of love from those who matter most. May it inspire you to acts of kindness and compassion. This is Majesty Sussex Report, and I'm Antonio. It for me and you. So I So I was thinking about what what what's the psychological makeup? No, like what's the template of a royal reporter or one of these people who are, you know, part of the royal rota um, in you know what what what's the psychological makeup, right? Because Listen, we, we have our own also, people who support the Sussex, like, there's certain qualifiers. Um, we're not all the same, of course, we, we don't, um, it's not like a homogeneous sort of group, but, but we have a couple of things in common, you know, at, at least two or three. Uh, uh, but but, but these, these people in general, I was like, what, what would be the majority of sort of that personality, type of personality psychologically, that would be drawn to being a, a, a sort of royal gossiper slash reporter. And, you know, what, what's the motivation really to, to maintain this institution? So... <laughs> I did a, a, a sort of my own kind of, not professional because I'm not a doctor or a psychologist or anything like that, but did some research and I kind of was trying to figure out like putting things together and I came up with sort of 
this sort of, I don't know, a sort of, I don't know, outline maybe of, of what the personality type might be like. But just, but just for kicks, all right, and laughs. So I was going to, as I was, I guess, you know, I, I, I sat down to sort of write out the ideas I have and, and to create this the the um, script for um, the episode, and <laughs> so I was gonna just do it sort of like a news part and say, okay, you know, King Charles attended uh, Easter service, but then since I was still in this topic about you know these royal experts, reporters, whatever, I thought. How would they write this? How would they write that event? So, <laughs> all right, ready? So, I, <laughs> I put, here we go. So this is how I, in the persona of a royal reporter, would have written about this. <laughs> here we go. Under the solemn gaze of a spring sun, the ancient stones of the St. George Chapel watched as history once again unfolded in its shadow. King Charles, at the tender age of 75, would Queen Camilla, <laughs> I can't believe I just said Queen Camilla, Queen Consort, a year his senior arrived not with the pomp of tradition but with the quiet dignity that the situation demanded. The Easter service, a tapestry of sacred melody and prayer beckoned them as it did others of the royal bloodline into its sanctified embrace. With the king's health, a whispered concern, this Easter was unlike any other. Arriving by car, a subtle shift from the grand carriages of your years gone by, the king stepped out, his hand gently rested on the chapel's venerable walls, as if to draw strength from the centuries of faith they had witnessed. He greeted the clergy with, with a nod, a shared understanding of the service, sanctity, and the weight it carries this year. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I really... Okay, folks, listen. I'm not trying to make fun of any of the stuff that is really serious, okay? That wasn't my intention. Now that I'm thinking about how some people may think. Or, you know. This is purely about the reporters. This is not about King Charles and his diagnosis and... Um, you know, dealing with cancer and so on. This is about how they would have wrote something, right? Explaining or talking about the king and the concert arriving at the chapel. And it just fascinates me. Because I'll be honest, it wasn't very hard to write at all. I just sat there and just sort of like... Just thought, embellish, embellish. Be very, like, ridiculously embellish. <laughs> because a lot of the stuff that they say and, and they write about is just, it's just weird. I guess, oh, he's just the, the manliest of the manliest of the, of, 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 of the, it's like, it's like a child. It's like a little kid talking about their superhero or this, this, I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, I, I, I really hope you take it in the spirit of 
me trying to, I don't know, embody how someone from the Royal Road or something like that would, would have written or talked about this. And um, again, I'm not making fun of the king or of his um, diagnosis. I, I'm actually making fun of, you know, who we're making fun of. All right, so let's get to our next segment. All right, great. So let me just do a quick disclaimer. The following is not a professional analysis at all. I'm not an expert in any of this. I am not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I just did research based on sort of assumptions. And this is by no means an accurate portrayal or personification of anyone who considers himself a royal expert or reporter or anything like that. This is solemnly for fun based on research that I've done. Okay. So the psychology makeup of a royal expert or reporter um, has has a, has a, 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 a few of these um, in their, we would say, um, profile or, or uh, persona. Connective bias, confirmation bias. This person may selectively seek out, interpret, and recall information in a way that confirms their pre-existing beliefs and attitudes towards the monarchy. In-group bias, a strong identification with the in-group, in this case, royalist or monarchy supporters may lead to an automatic defense of the group and its members while viewing outsiders skeptically. Personality traits. Authoritarianism. They might exhibit high levels of conformity to traditional societal structures like the monarchy and show defense to authority, which aligns with their uncritical defense of royal figures. So they want authoritarianism, right? They like to have that 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 power, whereas you know the monarchy and a king, if they had their way, you know it wouldn't be a constitutional monarchy. It would be like the king rules and the, and whatever the king says, that's what goes, or the queen, right? Um, narcissism, not surprised with that one at all, uh, their defense of the monarchy could partly be fueled by a desire for um, status and admiration within their social or professional circles, where loyalty to the monarch is highly valued. Do you, do you see, like, another profile of us another certain type of people that is very similar to this think about it all right think about it um agreeableness agree agreeableness is low they may display lower level of agree agreeableness as indicated by a readiness to engage in confrontational behavior when defending their beliefs about the monarchy. Motivational factors. Need for connective closure. This individual might have a strong desire for um, de def sorry, for definite um, answers and a dis Discomfort with ambiguity, which aligns with a tendency to adapt strong, unwavering viewpoints. Social identity. Their self-concept 
may be significantly tied to their perceived role within the royal narrative, and defending the monarchy becomes intertwined with defending their own identity. That one hit me, because <laughs> it was like, oh, so they see themselves also as, right? They see themselves as the monarchy, and 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 this sort of pretense ness of 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 importance emotional aspects fear of change an underlying fear of societal change may drive their attachment to the stability and continuity that the monarchy represents righteous indignation how many have we seen with righteous indignation? Ooh. Do you say one thing and they all of a sudden become like, they can dish it out, but they can't take it back. They may experience genuine emotional distress when the monarchy is criticized and feel morally justified in attacking its detractors. Man. Defense mechanism, rationalization. They might rationalize any negative aspects of the monarchy or their own exaggerations and untruths as necessary for a greater good. So they see what they're doing as, well, it's for the greater good. It doesn't matter that I'm lying or exaggerating. It's for the greater good. It doesn't matter that I'm hiding this or that or, you know, it's for the greater good. It sounds like, um, uh, what's the series called again? Margaret Atwood. Um, shoot, I will remember. I read this in high school. Um, okay, projection. Negative traits or motives. Uh, sorry, negative traits or motives they perceive in others, such as being disloyal or unpatriotic may actually reflect their own internal conflict about the monarchy. <laughs> wow. Um, social and environmental influences. Echo chambers. So constant engagement in social or professional environments that reinforce their views may solidify their stance and diminish exposure to alternative perspectives. So it's like the same kind of idea of someone just watching Fox News, right? And staying within that, that circle. They, they, they don't seek out other versions of a story or anything like that. They, they, they stick with that and they find a group that's going to feed them more, more, more of that. Reward system. They might receive positive reinforcement for their fervent stance in the form of social val social val validation, um, professional advancement, or financial gain. So <laughs> we know all about that, right? They, 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 they write these books and, you know, that Okay, I'm not going to say what I was just going to say because it's going to reveal something else. Um, all right, so once once again, it, it is important to note that this profile is speculative and not all individuals who are passionate about the monarchy will fit this, this, this description. Human behavior is complex and individual... Every individual differs, right? Um, however, understanding the potential uh, underlying factors can provide insights into the behavior of individuals who exhibit an unwavering defense and a certain bit of obsession with the monarchy. And I just remember, Handmaid's Tale, Handmaid's Tale. Um, Margaret Atwood. Yes. All right. Not that my 
memory is working kind of okay. Um, also, I, I base this on one particular person. After I read an article on this person, I thought, hmm, interesting. Uh, but for this particular person, uh, there's some additional, you know, psychological factors, which are obsession with the royal family, for example. So a deep, long-standing infatuation with the royal family, especially from a young age, could um, stem from a need for es escapi escapism um, or a desire uh, for association with perceived prestige and power. This fixation might be a coping mechanism for personal dissatisfaction or lack of fulfillment where the individual finds solace or a sense of purpose in a grandeur kind of way. Um, I, idealizing the royal family and seeking proximity to them might indicate a high level of identification with the institution values, excuse me, or a desire for validation through association. This admiration can reflect um, aspirational desires where the individual projects personal ideas onto the royals, seeing them as, as an embodiment of success, elegance, and um, moral fortitude. Choosing a career that enables close observation or interaction with the royal family suggests a commitment to maintaining this connection. Defending the royal family fervently could be a defense mechanism protecting not only the object of one's admiration, but also one's own identity as the psychological investment in that admiration. Now, developing a negative fixation on a new member of the royal family may reflect resistance to change within a very much so cherished institution. This behavior can also stem from in-group versus out-group dynamics, where the individual perceives the new member as an outsider, disrupting the status quo. Psychologically, this might indicate difficulty adapting to change or a rigid attachment to um, idealized versions of people and institutions. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the selective targeting of, of, of negative attention towards a new royal family member while painting others in a positive light might also demonstrate cognitive bias, such as confirmation bias, where the individual seeks information that confirms pre-existing beliefs and ignores con uh, con con contradictory, con contradictory um, evidence. This behavior can be exacerbated by group groupthink um, if the individual is part of a larger community or a media circle and they share their similar views. So that's the profile. And um, now, do you want to know who I base this on? <laughs> do you really want to know? Do you really, really, really want to know? Do you really, really want to know? Um, all right. Now, remember, this is based on an interview that I've read and I will um, have part of that interview read out. How about I do this? How about I get the interview read out? Not all of the interview, just part of it read out and you'll immediately know who it is. So here it is. I love Camilla, but don't get me started on Meghan. As a little Jewish girl from the East End, Angela Levin stood outside Buckingham Palace in the hope that the then-Queen would invite her in for tea. That particular dream never transpired, 
but her fascination with the Windsors eventually delivered something far more remarkable. She became their biographer and, over her long career, has spent hours upon hours with members of the world's most famous family. That intimacy, she spent 15 months in discussions with Prince Harry, for her biography Harry, Conversations with the Prince, published in 2018, combined with Levin's willingness to express strident views on royal relationships, has also placed her firmly in the media spotlight. Levin's criticism of Meghan Markle, a woman she says is not easily pleased, has made her a target for the Duchess's social media supporters, a group she calls the Sussex Squad. It's been hideous, she says of her experience with the group, which, it should be said, is not the responsibility of Markle herself. I've been told, why don't I kill myself, you're not a journalist, you're just a liar. Anyone who dares criticize Meghan will find that they have a lot of people trying to get them down. People on social media were very angry with me about something and two people said that they'd discovered that I was in touch regularly with very right-wing people and that my friends were mainly Nazis. To tell a Jewish person that is absolute nonsense and wrong. Most recently, Levin has made clear her views on Meghan joining her husband in Germany this month for the Invictus Games, the sporting event Harry launched for wounded military personnel and veterans in 2014. This evening, our, our sort of evening, and um, you know, he shuts up. She's got the mic. Everybody heard that she did her own makeup. Oh my goodness! So she's just like an ordinary person now. Is that what that was all about? And um, you know, she's saying she. Okay, enough of that. Uh, so, what do you folks think? Does this person fit the? You know the 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 um profile i mean when i read the article it's fascinating to me you know this this fascination of meeting the queen since uh she was a very young a, a little girl and fascination with the royals and and being part of all of that and i think it was Two days ago, I was watching one of these stupid shows, and one of the royal commentators or experts, whatever he is, he made some comment about Megan that she is this... I'm not going to say what he said, actually. No one need to give that any more energy. But basically saying that, you know, there's only one thing that she's really done and she wasn't even really great in it. And you know what, 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 what I'm talking about. And he said, you know, Hollywood is a very fickle place. One day you, you, are, you are famous, the next day you are not, and you're out. So his whole thing was, they're only known because they're not really royals anymore, they're celebrities. So when their celebrity is over, then what are they going to do? Because they 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 have they had they have no other skills. They have nothing. And he was just going on about feeling sorry also for um, Harry. And I started laughing a little bit because I kept thinking, listen, you son of a, mm, you, your entire life, okay, your entire life, what you've done, is ride this pony you've got about you're an expert with the royal family, right? And all you freaking do is gossip and invent things. You, these people have been calling for the demise of Meghan and Harry now since what? I don't know, 1850? They weren't even born then? I know, I know I'm being ridiculous. But these people are ridiculous. Like, really? So... I just I just started laughing because I'm like it's the same stories they keep telling, and keep hoping that that oh they're gonna fail this time oh he's gonna come back oh this is gonna happen. I said it in my last my last podcast. I'll say it again. Why do you keep talking about them if you don't like them? Do you realize that you really have some psychological issues going on? Like, if I don't like someone, I don't make them part of my daily life. 
I don't go around talking to my friends about these people or those people. No. And you folks are insistently, you're so upset and you're so this, and oh, they're going to fail and they're that, and oh, she's so rude, and oh, she doesn't, and Hollywood doesn't like them anymore, and oh, she, she's making him do this, and oh, I feel so sorry for him. Listen, listen, listen to me. If she's making him do things, that means that that man wants her to make him do, do oh God, it's Easter Sunday. God forgive me. Um, I'm going to stop right there, right there. Um, <laughs> I don't know what was in my tea this morning, but I think I should have that tea again. Um, okay. So it kind of fits, right? And, and it just, it just fascinates me. It, it really, really does. It fascinates me that these, <laughs> these grown people. They go on television. They write these articles. And it's just so idiotic. And they've got the British people. I'm not saying all, everyone, but the ones who listen to them and read them and all this kind of stuff. Like, really believing in their crap. And their crap. Hoy. Okay. Hey, something, something I needed. And I, okay, so tomorrow, da, 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 I am going to activate the um, membership button. Um, I've been kind of hesitant to do it. I've been able to do it like a while ago. I feel kind of weird doing it, <laughs> but um, I need to get over my own, my own crap. And tomorrow I'm going to activate it. I want to give you a little bit. I'm, I'm, I redid the intro. So I want to show you a little bit. It's just a teaser of what the intro is going to look like as of tomorrow. That's um, that's part of the intro, and I think part of what um, sort of the new plan I have moving forward is to just have the same intro, because um, it it takes a lot of time for the intros that I usually do. Like it's it's a story by itself, and I'm not sure if if. People like it, don't like it, and um, so I'll still try and do stuff like that, but maybe I'll do it as a short, and uh, yeah, okay, I, you will see the entire thing tomorrow, and um, I think I'm going to end it here, I was planning to do one other thing, but um, I think this is enough time, also, a lot of you folks don't listen to the entire thing. A lot of you drop off, <laughs> which is either I'm absolutely boring or you're not interested in some of the things I talk about. But uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, it's your time, and I appreciate you at least hanging out here. I want to wish you all a very happy Easter. And for those who celebrate Easter... And I think even for those that don't, every holy book um, has lessons that they teach us that have one commonality, I think. And that is the way we treat each other, the way we behave with each other. That kindness is important, the way we uplift one another. 
one of those things that maybe I'm just an alien or something that I'll never, never understand. It's, it's how we are guided by these leaders that are just embedded in their DNA is conflict and wars and separation and how so many of us are easily convinced that if you don't look like me then you're evil or you're bad or all the stereotypes that I've heard of you are true. We are we are one people, you know. God created us, um, a divine being. If you want to be scientific, you know, we evolved. But it seems like we evolved, but we kept the, <laughs> the Neanderthal brain or something. I'm not sure. Anyways, wherever you are, I wish you a very, very wonderful day. Happy Easter again to those who celebrate and um, much love. Until we speak again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. 